morning, everyone. Today is September 23rd, 2021, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every week, Gene Lawler and I are so happy and excited to bring another great webinar to everyone, and there's no charge for these wonderful webinars. Rather, we ask people to contribute to a food bank and help fight food insecurity worldwide if they like what they see. And one of my favorite parts of the webinar every week is when we announce the running total of how much our generous audiences have contributed to food banks since the series began. So Gene, a virtual drum roll, and please let us know the total. <laughs> Ta-da! Um... Well, today we're up to $171,950. So we're getting close to the $200,000 mark. But in terms of uh, translating that to number of meals, that depending on which food bank's numbers, you know, they you, you use the formula, it's at least 2 million meals, if not more than 2 million meals that have been served thanks to the generosity of the participants and will work for food. Amazing. Thank you so much to the legal and ADR communities for being so very, very generous fighting food insecurity. And now to our program for the day. We're so excited to have Professor G. Richard Schell from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania talking to us today. Uh, Professor Schell is the author of so many important books in the fields of negotiation, Bargaining for Advantage, the classic, been in print so well over 20 years and translated into so many languages and used in so many, the curricula of so many schools and this wonderful book, The Conscience Code, another fantastic book. And I'll, I'll read you what it says about Professor Shell. G. Richard Shell is the Thomas Garrity Professor of Legal Studies, Business Ethics and Management at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of Bargaining for Advantage, The Art of Woo, uh, and the award-winning Springboard, Launching Your Personal Search for Success. He led the most recent redesign of the Wharton School's MBA curriculum and helped create its required responsibility and business course, which inspired The Conscience Code. He has two grown sons and lives with his wife, Robbie, near Philadelphia in Wynwood, Pennsylvania. So like, like they do on late night television, we, we plug the book, Richard, <laughs> we, we plug the book. So now we'd love to turn it over to you. Tell us a little bit about the food bank or you would encourage contributions if people are, into, uh, are in a position to contribute. And then your presentation, our new friend, Professor Richard Schell, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Jeff, Jane, and Natalie for inviting me on. Uh, it's, uh, you know, this is one of those intentions that's been a long time uh, in the birthing since we started talking about this last spring and we finally found a date, so it's a pleasure. Uh, so my food bank is Phil Abundance, uh, philabundance.org. Uh, and it's uh, a group that we've had uh, a longstanding relationship with, Robbie and I. Uh, they uh, are really the largest uh, you know, food bank in the city and they do a terrific job. They're very professional, they're very, um, uh, generous and and you know they've done a lot of innovative things over the years, especially you know collecting food from restaurants and and making sure nothing gets wasted and and in the pandemic especially really going into high gear to handle the emergency and the food insecurities that people face and still face. Um, so there, that's my that's my preferred um, group to be generous to. I. I in line with that, though, I can't help but also uh, plug and mention, I have a long-standing relationship with the United Food and Commercial Workers. I've worked with them for about 15 years and helped them with their collective bargaining groups and stuff. And, and you know, they were, they represent all the checkout people at Kroger's and, uh, and they do a, a lot of work in the delivery space. And uh, I think, you know, in addition to the people that have been helping with the food insecurities of the population that's been disenfranchised. I think a lot of times the people who are on the front lines keeping the food in the stores under this emergency, um, you know, don't get quite the, um, the same attention as maybe the nurses do. 
but um, but they're they're a very important part of the process of keeping us all fed too. So just give them a little plug because they're they're really great people. Um, okay, so um, so I thought in the you know it's a daunting thing to to talk to uh, you know, talk with uh, it, lots of very experienced people and people who do a lot of uh, very uh, high consequence uh, fraught just you know work to try to you know, make peace between people who would rather fight, uh, or at least they think they'd rather fight. And, um, you know, I come up from this, in, you know, the long way. I, I was a, a fellow at the program of negotiation at, at Harvard Law School many years ago and uh, worked with Howard Rafa and Roger Fisher and all those folks. And, uh, you know, getting to yes with the text that I cut my teeth on, bargaining for advantage was sort of my answer for that text. In the, in the end, having investigated the folks at Harvard, especially Roger Fisher, um, I realized that, get, at least this is my perspective, and before I wrote Bargaining for Advantage, Get Into Yes is a book about how to cooperate for someone who's really competitive. Because once you get to, if you ever got to know Roger Fisher, uh, you know, though, he, he was a competitive guy. <laughs> and, uh, and he was kind of learning to be collaborative and cooperative as a result of his work in international relations and making uh, peace and, and all the good work they do at, at the program. And so if the interesting data point for that is the word leverage never appears in getting to yes. And as I entered my professional life at the Wharton School of Business, which is a deal-making environment, not, not a conflict resolution environment, um, you know, I was using Getting to Yes, and I realized I was teaching deal makers with the wrong book. Uh, it's a conflict management book and a very, very good one. And I teach it as a conflict management book with Bargaining for Advantage as the deal making book. Uh, and so I actually had a chance to build on the, on the platform that they had and offer perspectives that were much more like how people actually do deals uh, and a little less about how they manage conflicts. Uh, and, um, and interest, of course, the currency of our all collective work is common to both areas. Um, you know, finding out what people really need, what they want is the currency of the realm to both doing deals and also helping them unpack uh, uh, conflicts when they get off the rails. Uh, so that, that's not a quibble with that. Uh, but uh, there, in my view, there's no such thing as an objective criteria. Uh, there's just the criteria people either use or believe in. And, um, you know, if you believe in it, then it looks objective, but that probably isn't going to be shared by everyone in the room, whatever your view is. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk for a bit and I'm really open to, I, Jeff and Gene assured me that they're going to, they're going to interrupt me and, and, and pepper me with whatever questions come up in the chat or anything else. And I'm, I'm totally comfortable and happy, uh, you know, getting as far or as not as far as, as I do in this, in this slide deck. Um, but I tried to think, what could I offer this group, very experienced people, by way of some perspectives that they may not have thought as much about as some others. And so I try to look back on a number of my different books and, and the way I teach, because I have a course uh, for executives at Wharton on negotiation, but I also have a course on strategic persuasion. And so I've actually done a lot of work combining these subjects in a way that, that I thought you might find interesting uh, as a way of parsing out what's really going on in this human communication process that we all have to engage in. So I'm going to do that, and then I'll, we'll just uh, take it uh, uh, from there and see, uh, see if I can get this up. So can you all see this? Is that part? Yep, okay. I think now, so. Okay, now I have to figure out how to advance the slides uh, because here we go, next, okay. Now it should work, good, okay. So uh, these are, you know, I've got a third, actually a fifth book called um, Make the Rules or Your Rivals Will. That's a, a, about strategic uses of law. Uh, in commercial life. But these are the four that are much more psychological and process oriented. And the Conscience Code is the most recent one. It's about standing up for values in a workplace setting. So it's not so much about uh, resolving conflict as instigating it when the stakes are high enough to be worth instigating it. And, uh, and then how to do it effectively so that you don't end up uh, 
uh, having to leave your job or um, or injuring your credibility, but you do it in a way that advances the goal. So that's the array of things. And today I'm going to talk uh, about four different topics. Um, one, a model I have of where negotiation and conflict fit into this overall picture of interpersonal influence. Talk a bit about the foundations for credibility as a psychological factor, which is a really important for all mediators and, and the kind of thing you guys check off um, quickly, but also affects the perceptions of your parties vis-a-vis -vis each other. And then bring a persuasion frame to parsing conflict, a model I call PCAN, which I'll explain when we get there. And then the very vital importance of uh, what lawyers sometimes call the million dollar metaphor, which is uh, the metaphor that allows a tort lawyer to convince a jury that uh, either their client has a, a, a claim worth compensating or uh, if you're a defense lawyer, a claim that shouldn't be allowed. Uh, but uh, communicating with ordinary people involves images, analogies, figures of speech, uh, that I think are vital tools. And I'll just remind us about that. And then look at personality as a factor, uh, which uh, is in bargaining for advantage. I understand you were sent a copy of the uh, version of uh, the personality set that I've created for that book that it comes out of the Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument, which is an older and, and uh, more expensive way to parse the same subject. Uh, so I tried to reproduce it in a way that's more related to negotiation and also uh, that doesn't um, cost $40 a person to use. Uh, so I got a copyright cleared by a very important and, and uh, uh, is distinguished copyright law firm in Washington, D.C. So I would made sure to keep it straight. So let's start with the circles of influence. So the way I see the topic that we are engaged in every day when we're mediating or negotiating is that there are three things going on, not one. And the biggest outside envelope is influence. And that is what are people's perceptions of you? And the most important concept within that is credibility, which I'm gonna to get to in a second once I just show my perception of what these topics are that we engage in and how they relate to one another. So as I see it, you know, influence is everything you do, verbal and nonverbal, accidentally on purpose, how you dress, uh, whether you speak the language of the other party, whether you are on time, um, you know, what they think about these important dimensions of you, especially against their expectations. So, um, so for example, if you're um, in a situation in which telling the truth, uh, you, which you normally think would be something that would add to your influence, uh, is something that actually the circumstances are such that you'd be an idiot if you didn't tell the truth, uh, then you're not going to get a lot of influence by telling the truth. <laughs> you're going to get a pass. They're going to say, well, this person's got their head screwed on. That's good. They told the truth. But you're not going to get a lot of credit for it. Um, so a lot of influence on the positive side comes from doing stuff that's above their expectations on these virtues. You're more reliable, you're more truthful, you're more um, compassionate than they had a reason to expect. Uh, and then, you know, your, your currency goes up a little. And of course, you can fall short of expectations. And if you're Mother Teresa and you get caught lying once about some small matter, then you, you, know, you lose influence because you're Mother Teresa and everybody expected you to be a saint. So expectations are the baseline. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but managing them is a critical skill as a result of that. Uh, a special kind of influence, as I see it, is persuasion. And we persuade by offering reasons, justifications, data uh, that they will find appealing. So Aristotle pretty much summed up the secret of successful persuasion, know your audience. That's his critical message in the rhetoric. And, uh, and so that's why it matters so much how you prepare for the group that you're working with, because all of us have our favorite reasons and our favorite data and our favorite justifications that we think are the right and, and winning ways to think about something. But it will be unpersuasive. You'll be right, but you'll be unpersuasive if you don't think about the reasons and the evidence and the justifications that's gonna to appeal to them. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, is a critical part of preparation uh, in many, many ways. Now notice, I haven't even gotten to negotiation yet. One of the things that I offer in Bargaining for Advantage that is in distinction to getting to yes has to do with this very point because 
Um, my sense is that uh, there are no objective criteria unless it's in physics, and even that is pretty contested depending on the, you know, the era that you're in. What I say about standards is that they're powerful when they're the standards the other guy believes in, the other side believes in, or that the people believe in, and that they're not powerful when they don't. Uh, so then you have a pathway to persuading them which is offering the evidence and arguments that the standard is in fact fair or that it's reasonable or that it's been used many times or whatever. Uh, but until they believe in the standard, it doesn't really have much traction uh, uh, that's different from just interest. You know, they're gonna do it because it's in their interest to do it. Uh, one of my favorite quotes of all time is JP Morgan, uh, the banker in the 19th century, uh, who said with a slight modification of gender pronouns, um, there are two reasons for everything a person does, a good reason and the real reason. And the good reason is usually the standard. Uh, you know, it's company policy that we have to do this, or it's good for the community that we have to do this. But the real reason is usually related to interests. Uh, you know, we'll gain more, we'll, we won't lose as much, uh, you know, we'll be more influential, we'll be more powerful, we'll have uh, more people following us if this result happens. Uh, so the only reasons that really count are the reasons the other side actually believes in. They're not just good reasons, they're the reasons they believe in. And that's when you get some traction in a mediation, when you offer a justification for an outcome that connects to their way of thinking and say, you know, this is, uh, this is something that um, a member of your spiritual community would find resonant with this value. I, I would like you to just consider that as a frame of reference as you consider this proposal, um, uh, or it might be something relating to the importance of family, if that's a high priority as opposed to just financials, or, or it may be financials uh, yeah, because you've been appealing to their sense of compassion and actually they don't have one. So, um, so persuasion happens with reasons and, and fairness is a very big part of our discussion in mediation and negotiation uh, that involves persuasion. Then we get to negotiation, which does involve the core of our motivations. People negotiate because they have needs and fears. Just like a snail will move toward food and move away from threat, Humans will move toward what they desire and away from what makes them anxious and insecure. And so the negotiation process, as I see it, is the core kind of, um, the, the core middle part of your brain where emotions dwell. And that means that you have all of the human system in play when you negotiate because you are working with their perceptions, which is, intuitions, instant judgments, prejudices, biases, all the stuff that's just happening at light speed that's forming their impressions about people. Then you have persuasion, which is the cognitive part of the landscape and you're offering things to try to change their picture in their head about some part of what's happening, what's true, what's gonna happen in the future, uh, what, uh, what's fair. All these are cognitive things. We have to process them in a deliberative way. And then in the middle is the emotion. And that's uh, why it's so important to read others' faces when you're working with them directly, because the emotions are hard to hide. Uh, it's so important to hear the pauses between what they say, because you're, you're sensing that they might be uh, going through some sort of operation where they're gonna deceive to protect a position or to protect a fact. And you're making judgments and interpretations about that, but that's all we have about other people are reading their affect. So you have to be a, a real master of reading other people to be good as a negotiator or mediator, because of course, if we had another circle in this, it would be dispute management and mediation inside the negotiation, because I think that's a special form of negotiation. Uh, but in my view, you can't negotiate without also persuading and influencing. And I don't think you can mediate without knowing a lot about negotiation, persuasion, and influence. They're all tightly connected. You can persuade without negotiating. We can have a seminar about whether Pluto is the final planet in the solar system and offer lots of evidence about that and dispute it and have conflicts over it. But we're not negotiating it. That's not something 
uh, where someone's needs and fears, other than their career interests uh, in, in uh, the science community are gonna be triggered. Um, so I just wanna make one distinction before I move on here, because I found it a revelation myself after I wrote Bargaining for Advantage and I started to write The Art of Woo, which is winning others over. It's the art and science of selling ideas. There are two completely different kinds of conflicts and one is much more difficult than the other. And they relate to this, you know, they both bring influence to the table, but a persuasion problem, the nuttiest and hardest persuasion problem is a conflict over beliefs. People have fixed ideas, worldviews, uh, things that they're completely wrapped up with in their identity about who they are and what the world means. And that conflict over beliefs in my view, is the hardest possible conflict to manage. And I ended up coming to the conclusion after studying this for a while that we never ever persuade someone to change a belief, never. And so it's futile to think that you have that power, that you can offer an argument or evidence that will change someone's belief. What we can do is offer evidence, arguments, persuasion uh, templates and different things, and then give them enough space so that they change their own belief. Uh, and that's a different kind of challenge than thinking that you can go into a meeting and change someone's mind about a belief. And the second kind of conflict is actually easier, and that's conflicts over interests. And the conflict over an interest is where we negotiate. There's something scarce, it has to be allocated, and we want to offer some uh, you know, version of it for them in order for them to give something else to us that we need. And there's an exchange of some sort, uh, whether it's over time or at, at, a, at a simultaneous exchange where we craft agreements that meet interests and needs. And you probably realize a lot of times in a mediation and, you, and people start to argue and your instinct says, you know, let's uh, agree to disagree about that and let's move on to our interests. And what you've really encountered is a disagreement about beliefs. And you're smart enough to know that's not gonna have any cheese uh, for the mediation process. So let's uh, abandon it. But when what is being offered um, conflicts with a belief, then you mix the two up. And there's really, that's, that's concrete. When you mix a conflicting interest with a conflicting belief, uh, then you have a kind of real concrete that requires some other modes to get people to move off of them. And I think that's, this is my theory. I don't know any more about this than all of you do, but I think that's why our politics today are so fraught because what used to be the process of sort of having political positions and then negotiating to common ground on underlying interests and needs has now gotten rigidified by polarized beliefs about what's legitimate uh, and it's mixed in with those interests. And so when you offer a compromise that might advance interests, people see it as disrespectful to their beliefs. And so the compromise is no longer possible because we, we, we can't unpack these two things. They've gotten thoroughly mixed up and it makes it very, very difficult uh, to find the art of compromise because we don't compromise our beliefs about uh, what's ethical. You know, you don't trade. Well, I'll tell you what, you can lie, uh, you know, this much if I can lie that much. Um, just not the currency that we use to talk about beliefs. And so we're in a tough spot because these two things have gotten mixed up. They've always been mixed up for some people, but they've gotten mixed up for a lot of people. And, uh, and so we're, we're in a, a pickle. Uh, we'll see, we've, we've got a reality check coming down the pike pretty soon because Biden, who's an old school negotiator from the Senate is trying to bring his team into the White House and say, hey, let's get back to interest here. Uh, and his own team is divided on the question of beliefs. Uh, and they may be willing to burn down the house because their belief that climate change or uh, social inequality or whatever it is, is the number one. And they're not willing to say that anything else can be number one. And so you know, that will, they'll bring down the house. I hope not, um, but that's the problem. Okay, so this is a model and credibility, I'll just bring these up quickly, 
is this influence sector. And this is, again, stuff you all know. It's, um, it's intuitive, but I do break it out in a way that makes it easier to kind of uh, contextualize. And basically, uh, you know, this is a sort of 80-20 rule. These are the 20% of the factors that make up 80% of people's perceptions of your credibility. And it means that they have to know it. You know, credibility is not something you have. Credibility is a gift other people give you based on their perceptions that you have the right authority, that you know what you're talking about, that you have experience and competence based on hard won uh, trial and error, wins and losses, you're battle tested. And so your advice is gonna have some wisdom in it because of competence. And notice the difference between expertise and competence. You know, they're related. You can gain expertise by adding to your competence. But credibility for competence is they know you've done it a lot and done it well. Credibility for expertise is my first slide. I got these four books up there. Uh, and people go, oh, that guy's an expert. He wrote some books. But if I'm going to have surgery down here at the University of Pennsylvania on you know, a hernia or something, I'm not really looking for the person who wrote the book on hernia operations. I'm kind of interested in the person who does them 20 times a week. Uh, to work on me because every case is its own individual item on the distribution of outcomes. And the surgeon who does it 20 times a week will see my little hernia and go, oh, look, this is, uh, you know, I've only seen this twice in the last year. Uh, and, and then they get to apply that problem solving skill. That's not the ideal model. It's the experience that makes it possible for them to be good at it. And of course, all of you know that as a result of your experience as mediators. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last one is trust. And, you know, trust is, you know, it's funny how this topic works, isn't it? You have influence, which is a fuzzy word. You unpack it, you get to credibility, which is a fuzzy word. You unpack it, and you get to trust, which is a fuzzy word. So it's fuzzy words all the way down. It's like turtles all the way down. Uh, so what about trust? So I've investigated trust a little more. And this actually comes from some work I did with the FBI in their hostage coding uh, programs down in Quantico. They sent some folks up to our programs. I went down and worked with them and theirs. And, um, you know, they kind of taught me that, you know, trust comes from a lot of things, it comes from being reliable, honest, um, you know, has all the Aristotelian virtues associated with, uh, with trust. But there's a trigger that causes trust to occur and that causes it to disappear in a very short amount of time. And the trigger, which a hostage negotiator has to establish in very fraught conditions with someone who's very, very uh, crisis, in, in crisis, is the perception that the other party is there to help them, to advance their goals, and to give them things that they need at some sacrifice to their own goals. So, you know, you can gain sort of reciprocity based relationship with someone by giving and taking an equal measure. But if you want to gain trust with someone, you have to go out of your way and show them that you're willing to do stuff that's inconvenient or that might make you vulnerable or that might uh, show your weakness. And you all know this from uh, mediations where you've you know, you've had a trouble establishing rapport, but then you've found a place where you can share something about yourself that you didn't have to share that shows you're not perfect or that shows you suffered and that makes you a human and the other person suddenly sees you in a different light. And it's not just that they see you as having a common background. There's something about the vulnerability that causes this trigger to happen. Uh, now in business, in negotiations, trust comes from the same thing, but it, it means that you do favors for people that are out of the way and without looking for a quid pro quo. As soon as you start looking for a quid pro quo, it becomes reciprocity again. Uh, and the magic sauce is this, I'm willing to rely on them. Now, the reason I say the trigger is important is because we all know how easy it is to lose trust. And all it takes to lose trust is to do one self-interested thing that confirms their hypothesis that you were actually in it for yourself all the time. And now whatever judgment they may have had that you were kind of in a special category disappears. And winning it back, that perception that you're there as a partner uh, to help them uh, is much more difficult than establishing it in the first place. Um, so I think, you know, looking for the, all those opportunities to build credibility based on trustworthiness is not just are you as reliable as they expected, 
It's are you as more reliable than they expected? Are you more honest than they expected? Are you more uh, compassionate than they expected? And how can you bring that spark uh, to this interaction that allows that magic to happen? Now, as I'm gonna leave this topic, but I just wanna point out something because in the wake of my study of this, I realized that there are only two types of people that are truly gifted at establishing trust. And none of us are these two types. So that's why it's so hard for us. The first type is a saint, and they are living lives of self-sacrifice in which they've built that uh, credibility based on being self-sacrificing over so long a period that, and they've done so much good in the world by doing that, that we just, you know, we just, you know, give them our respect and trust as a result of their sainthood. Uh, the second are psychopaths. Psychopaths are glib, charming, crafty, mentally uh, uh, damaged people who are um, gifted with one skill and they have an entire deficit on the other one, both of which are important in interpersonal negotiations and mediation. The gift they have is reading other people's needs and fears. They're good at perspective taking. They're excellent at saying, ha, what's really motivating this person? What do they want? What's the hook that will get them to move toward me? What's missing is empathy. They have no compassion whatsoever. And so you combine those two, you've got a really, really dangerous combination. Uh, and as fate would have it, somewhere between one and 3% of people, and the 3% represents business and law a little more than the rest of the community, are psychopaths. They're clinical psychopaths. Now that doesn't sound like a high number, uh, but if you have a million people, that's a lot of psychopaths. And they don't come with a sign like labeling themselves. Uh, like Bernie Madoff, the most recent, you know, very famous version of this is someone who operated for 30 years and he's definitely a psychopath. Uh, but he was able to manage everyone's perceptions of credibility by being the head of the NASDAQ, by being an expert in investments, by beating the market year after year after year, and by having this, uh, we're in it for you, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to help the temple with their uh, fundraising, we're going to, you know, help make sure the opera stays in, in good shape, and, you know, it was just a big Ponzi scheme, and he was enriching himself, and but there you are, he got away with it for 30 years because he had all the indicia of credibility and he was utterly trustworthy to his audience, but completely untrustworthy as a human. So don't think you have some gift that you can spot these people. Um, they're hard to spot. And that's why it's so difficult to trust others. So I think somewhere in our subconscious, uh, evolution has programmed us to be somewhat suspicious when we have this feeling of trust emerging and we ask ourselves, are we ready, you know, for this? That's why marriage is such a fraught and, and, and you know, kind of incremental process to find a life partner that we're actually going to believe in for the rest of our lives. Uh, it takes time. It's rare. Um, and I think it's because, you know, uh, you know it's, uh, there's a possibility, not trivial, but not common, uh, that you're dealing with someone who's going to, you know, create, get you to, to go do all the collection of marbles, and then they're going to take them all and then disappear in the sunset. Um, so just keep this in mind. Um, now, a little bit of persuasion uh, uh, arguments that are in the persuasion literature. And I think this pecan idea, which I'm gonna unpack for you so you know what it means uh, in a second, helps you understand where you get disagreements over beliefs in a process of conflict management. Because Aristotle and the great rhetoricians of the classical world taught us that there are many standard forms of argument. There are arguments of toward you know, whether to uh, argue on behalf of a matter of truth or arguments about a matter of morality. And then there's that argument of what they call the matter of policy, which is a policy argument is an argument over what to do next, which is the most common argument you have in mediation, the most common one we have in, in organizational life. What should we do next? And when we have that argument, cognitive psychology has actually reinforced this classic insight. Humans process this in four steps with four questions. And the first question is when the, you know, the question comes out, what should we do next? Everybody immediately wants to say, well, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, and if you have disagreements about what the problem is, 
then you're stuck. You can keep going and arguing, but if they don't think the problem is the same as you do, or the two parties in the mediation don't think it's the same problem, you're just talking out the window and you haven't connected them yet. So one of the things about this, you have to keep people on the dance on the same page as they take each step. So the job of the neutral is to redefine the problem in a way both sides can buy into it, which means you have to kind of get below their statement of the problem to some, you know, well, it's uh, the problem is that, you know, you husband are a bully, knows it's a husband. The problem is you spouse are, uh, you know, untrustworthy and be you betrayed me. And the mediator says, uh, well, you know, thank you for those problems. The problem is how can we fix this for the children? And now we've redefined the problem. Uh, and, and hopefully they both buy into it. Uh, so, but until you get there, they're stuck at the problem. The next thing humans want to know is how do we get here? Given this problem, what's the story? And th if you tune into any congressional hearing, that's what's going on at the congressional hearing. Something bad happened and people are testifying that it's the other people's fault, that that's why we got here. Um, now, I think causes, which often are where blame comes in, is the kind of thing mediators ought to finesse. And that is say, well, you know, there may be many reasons and many stories about how we got here, but we're here. So let's see where we can figure out a way to, to move forward and agree to disagree on our stories. Because in fact, causation, even in science is always indefinite. Uh, and so getting agreement on causes, you can stay there for a long time and go nowhere but circles, but they will wanna go there. So it's really important that you know about C. And then finally, third, answers. So each side will have their favorite answer. Uh, you know, well, you should give me the house or, you know, well, you should, uh, you know, forego alimony. Uh, and you have to move them off the commitments to those answers to options, which is the classic getting to yes insight. And then you have to sell them. And the last thing is, what's the best solution for all, relatively speaking, that's better than the status quo? And so you have to make the offer, and this is where persuasion comes in. You offer the evidence, the justifications, the reasons that both sides can buy into, at least in part, that allows them to say, oh, well, okay, I'm gonna concede part of my favorite answer in exchange for part of their favorite answer, and we'll come to some, you know, something that gets us there. The thing about this structure, PCAN, is that it applies in all cases of issues of policy. So if you're in your firm trying to make an argument about strategy, it's exactly the same format that you're going to have to use eventually with the team that's trying to devise the strategy because you're going to say, well, I've got this strategy uh, suggestion. Here's the problem we're trying to solve. Here's how we got here. We don't have an office in China yet. Um, here's a, my proposed answer, which is it's feasible. It's legitimate. We can partner with another law firm that's already there or whatever it is. But now here's why it's the best answer all things considered against doing nothing or anything else. And so the, your argument will structure better, it will be more persuasive, and it will your audience will follow it if this is what you do, because in the end, that's what their minds are doing anyway. And I think in mediation, it's really important to recognize that this is where it can go off the rails. It can go off the rails at any one of these four steps, and that it's not about negotiation, really. It's not about interest, necessarily. It's about the structure of the rhetorical problem. And so uh, I offer that to you as a perspective. And then, you know, images, uh, you all know this implicitly, uh, you know, better metaphors be eat data for lunch. You know, if you have data, but no story about the data, you're not gonna be persuaded. It's just gonna be a bunch of numbers. So I think usually it's really important. Lawyers know this when they're in tort cases, that's the million dollar metaphor. Uh, you know, what's gonna be the metaphor that's gonna, you know, keep the jury on your side. And I think where, when you're in the room, people will bring implicit metaphors. Uh, you know, you treat, if you treat a dog like you're treating me, you'd be arrested. That's a perspective on, on the other side. Uh, you know, where I live, you still believe, we still believe in handshakes. You gave your word. That's another metaphor. And, you know, culture, age, all these variables that come into who people are will affect the metaphors that they find persuasive. I would just offer this perspective and then we'll get the personality. I learned this as a teacher early, and I think it's why I'm a successful teacher in my little world. A mentor told me 
um, you know, went to a class, listened to me teach, and then came back afterwards and said, Richard, you know, you know a lot. Let me offer you a perspective. No one in your class will ever learn anything except on the foundation of what they already know. And so your job is to build a bridge between what they already know and what you're trying to tell them. And metaphors are really good bridges and they're very efficient. You know, if you can say, like in, in the um, Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, in the, 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 the moment when Kennedy, the Kennedy brothers were sitting there and they were being advised by their military people to bomb Cuba, the surprise attack. And you may remember Robert Kennedy sh sh gave a little note to his brother on, in writing. And the note said, now I know how Tojo felt just before Pearl Harbor. And when John Kennedy read that note, the whole meeting changed because the, that metaphor projected him into the role of the Japanese emperor <laughs> bombing Pearl Harbor. <laughs> and he didn't want to be that person. And so from there on, it was, okay, that's off the table. How else can we solve it? So that one metaphor, which Robert Kennedy came up with, you know, in the moment, was actually enough to completely change the course of history. Uh, and uh, that's what you're looking for in the room. What's the metaphor that you can make that sells the proposal, that sells the agreement, that sells that it, it makes it seem vivid and likely and fair and legitimate and part of their tradition to them. Uh, and that's hard. So you have to be trolling for that all the way through the process. Um, and so in the end, the world's complex. You have to make it simple. The world's uncertain. You have to you know, recognize that they work on beliefs, not on uncertainty. The world's slow to change. Your job is to inject urgency to move them to action. That's where deadlines and other things come in handy. And the world is, in fact, fact-based, but stories are what get facts meaning. And so you have to be a gifted storyteller to bring those facts to life. So this is just a little template of things you might want to think about when you feel you're in a tough spot and just realize, well, maybe I'm making it too complicated. Maybe I'm not respecting the fact this is a belief. What can I do to inject urgency that I haven't done already? And what's a story I can tell about what this is all about and what's going to happen if we don't resolve it? Personality, which is the assessment you gave, is something I've used for gen, you know, decades, and I, I got it from the Thomas Kilman instrument uh, in, in the first place. I was uh, you know, working at the Harvard Program of Negotiation. This was part of the curriculum I inherited early in my career. And I really think it's insightful and important that people have, you can't give this to your parties and say, here, take this assessment, then I'll know how to deal with you. Um, in a negotiation sense, it helps if you know your own style, and have some sense of your own personality and the intuitions. Because this isn't about behavior, it's not about skill. There's one person we talk to more every day in our lives than anyone else, ourselves. And so this is kind of unpacking the conversation you're having with yourself when you're in a conflict or negotiation mode. And the voice that's coming up from below is, Hey, let's get along to get along. You know, let's give get along and you know, just kind of give give something up, and get along. Or I let's let's avoid this. Let's let's sidestep this. Let's defer it to another day. Or let's split the difference. You know, let's get this behind us. Or this is an interesting problem. Let's unpack it and spend lots of time on it and get all the interests and you know, really drain it. Or I'm gonna win. Let's how do I figure out where to get in this room so I can win? Those are the impulses coming up based on stimuli. And some are more vivid than others. And that's why the assessment's helpful because if you score a high score on one of these, it's gonna tend to make it more of a persistent voice. Um, if you score low on it, it'll be a dimmer voice. And you can still do all these things, of course, uh, but it, you know, you're gonna have a bias about which ones you can get to first. And then you have to talk back to that voice a little bit when your judgment says, wait a minute, this is not really an appropriate situation for this voice to dominate. Uh, so Jeff, you and I were talking before the program started and you told a very interesting story about your own taking of this assessment and, and an insight you had. So I wonder if you could share that. Yes, thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, being just a little vulnerable, vulnerable about it, I mentioned to you that when I took the assessment last night, I was a little surprised at how high I scored on the avoidance scale. And I was, you know, triggered all sorts of 
thoughts about my upbringing and how my parents behave towards conflict and all that sort of thing. And I was thinking about a personal situation with a, uh, <clears throat> a family member where we're trying to work out a solution to a problem. And I thought to myself, gee, you know, I am in uh, uh, too strongly in the conflict avoider or perhaps accommodator mode. And maybe it's time just to say, look, there's a way to, there's a way this thing should come out. It's fair to everybody. It kind of goes by the rules of such situations. And it, it gave me the insight to, uh, to fight my instincts and fight my tendencies where doing so wasn't really serving anybody's interests, least of all mine. Yeah, and I, I think that's what happens when you take an assessment and you and you you know you're honestly answering the questions. You know the questions are obviously going to change the answers depending on situation and you're talking with. But if you do it in a neutral frame of mind where you're just going, well, on balance, which of these two things feels more like you know comfortable for me or the place I like to be, and you just sort of answer them all thirty times, and you get a pattern where um, you know you defer the conflict. You know you like. Uh, you know, you have peace and harmony as a preferred way to operate and you see the pattern, then you can, then you recognize the voice of, oh, maybe we shouldn't just wait another day and see if this doesn't go away. <laughs> or maybe somebody else will come and they'll do something and I won't have to deal with it. And you recognize that's a pattern and it's often functional, uh, but in certain situations, it's one your judgment might override. And, and so that little moment, that's an optical moment based on the assessment, I thought was just a classic situation where it added some value. I, my, young, my older son did a mediation program at his high school back in the day. He went to Germantown Friends High School, which is a friend's school out here outside of Philly. And they have a, a six-week period in the winter semester where they go do uh, community service and they just stop school for the, the class and out they go. And he got in a community mediation program in one of the neighborhoods in Philly. And they gave him this assessment as part, it was the Thomas Kilman version of it, but they gave him this as part of his sort of onboarding and stuff to help him think about mediation. And he scored, his two high scores were in accommodation and collaboration. And, and he went through that mediation program like a hot knife through butter. They, the feedback was, he's gifted. He knows how to do this. He's like, you know, he's got the instincts. And it, it occurred to me in the light of that one data point that being high avoider means you're diplomatic, you're tactful, you look for ways to diffuse confrontation. It's an automatic processing thing. You did it before your kid's wedding and you didn't want to create the seating that would cause people difficulties, you know. And collaboration and problem solving is sort of this deeper dive into what the situation is, what the real problem, how can we bring people to some understanding about a common problem. And, and that's also, if you're high in that automatic pilot, you know, you love to unpack problems like that. You love the process of socializing problems and getting them out. And the other three are perfectly legitimate things, accommodations about empathy and, and wanting to help other people, compromise about you know, kind of closing and finding good standards or reasonable standards that can just face saving standards that get us out of this problem. And then competitiveness is, you know, trying to win. Uh, with certain situations, you want to get a better price for a car. You know, it's good to be competitive and not silly uh, about that. So, um, so, but I did think it was interesting that avoidance and collaboration are two behaviors that mediators use a lot. And if the assessment were to show that you were high in them, either by virtue of having a lifetime of experience, which you know, that can affect your scores or just by predisposition, that that's sort of interesting news for a certain kind of mediation context. I mean, I personally think people trust other people who are like themselves. And so it could be that if a very competitive person is in the mediation, they may need to see a flash from you that you're willing to stand up for yourself in the process in order for them to go, oh, okay, well, this person's, you know, got a backbone, so I can trust them a little bit. You know, they're not going to get manipulated by the other side or whatever fantasy is going on. I mean, there's a wonderful quote. Uh, I'll, I'll get you to my next slide on this. So why it matters, I think, is it's a source of behavior. <laughs> and, you know, it's easily overridden by judgment, but it's still there. And, and the impulses can be important. And it's good to know about them. This gets me to the insight I was about to share. It's also important because the thief thinks everybody steals. And that's an American folk saying. But if you're highly competitive, you really believe other people are competitive somewhere until they prove they're not. And it's hard to get to that place. 
And just think of our last president, competitive person. You know, we got no value judgments about anything else about him. Just competitive person. We can agree. What do you think he thinks everybody else is? A really competitive person that can't be trusted. And there we go. Uh, from that kind of sense of the world, a lot of stuff begins to make sense about predicting the behavior. I actually wrote a, one of my favorite articles of my own in recent times was an article I wrote for the Negotiation Journal called Transactional Man. You can find it there. And it's a whole download on Trump's bargaining style, including how he got through his real estate career and his branding career and predictions about how he might manage the presidency. And I, I think, you know, the thief thinks everybody steals helps a lot to unpack any uh, judgment you might have about that. Confirmation bias is behind it. We look for things that, you know, we see things we're looking for. And if we're competitive, we look for signs. Other people are competitive. They become more vivid. And then we say we're right. And then we can start acting that, the way that's appropriate to that. The same thing, of course, works the other way. If you're highly accommodating and not uh, very competitive, then your confirmation bias will be toward looking for the good in others and how to get them to trust me. And, and that will often mean you do things for them to build trust, which is the normal way to do it. But you're expecting reciprocity and a highly competitive person may see that as weakness and then they take advantage. And then you haven't built any credibility because your confirmation bias is leading you down the wrong path. So that's when you need to like reverse engines and not get angry at them. They're just being who they are, but just change your tone. Uh, and then finally, we can misconstrue behavior, your parties will especially, based on personality differences, because they'll think that this competitiveness is intentional and tactical. And actually it may just be a part of their personality. Um, you know, I've worked with the United Food Commercial Workers. I mentioned that earlier. They're a very blunt, direct culture. They're a two on avoidance with each other, not to mention the people they negotiate with. So if you're with um, a negotiator from their group and they're being blunt, direct, and, and sort of pound on the table, you may think this is a tactic to trying to manipulate, trying to bully us. No, it's not part of their, their, their tactical playbook. It's who they are. And if you want to get to them, be blunt, direct, back. And then people will go, oh, I can deal with this person. I can understand them because they're like me. So the fundamental attribution error is just another robust psychological dimension, which is um, you know, we tend to explain our own behavior by virtue of circumstance. We're speeding down the highway because we have to get the emergency room and we have to meet our spouse there because there's an important issue for our child. But when we view other people, all we can see is their behavior. And so when we see a speeding car racing by us on the highway, we go, there's a reckless driver who's going to kill someone and they're a bad person, even though they are speeding toward the emergency room in order to get to their uh, spouse, to get to their child. So we had this attribution error. We excuse our own behavior. We blame and attribute character evidence to others. And this is a problem. And you have to be careful that you don't misattribute uh, the behavior that's happening as intentional when it's actually uh, unconscious and personality-based. So that's, and I talked a little longer than I thought. I thought I'd be interrupted constantly, but you're very generous and you listened to me the whole time. But we got five minutes. Uh, don't forget Phil Abundance, uh, Jeff and Gene, I'll turn it over to you. Any Anything come up? Wow, Richard, what a presentation. So chock full of gems of wisdom and insight. Thank you so much. Gene, in the few minutes that we have, are there some questions that our audience has posed? I can't you're hear muted. you, Jane. You're, you're, muted, you're, Jane. you're muted, Jane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so maybe you can take down the, uh, unshare the um, the screen then. I think everybody's okay. got a little abundance there so we can see each other better. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, fantastic. I tell you, the, the chat is just filled with uh, comments of uh, love and respect uh, <laughs> and all kinds of other wonderful things for you. Uh, we can print that out later, but things like fabulous presentation. Uh, I tr trust Richard Shell. He is very credible. It may be a kid. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. And there are no real questions in here, just uh, adulations, oh, if you will. Let me let me ask a question, Richard. Okay, sure, when, sure. You're in a, when you're in a negotiation situation, whether on your own behalf or as a mediator, and you sense this is just not going well, something's not right here, what, what's the 
what's the first thing that should run through our mind diagnostically in terms of how can I turn this situation around when it's not going well? Okay, I have less experience in mediation than I do in negotiation. So I'll start with that disclosure and, and disclaimer. But uh, people do come to me a lot uh, with negotiation problems for consulting purposes. And, um, and, and they never come unless the problem is close to impossible. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'm the court of last resort. But when they do, I have a decision tree and it breaks in two directions right away. So I, I'll share that with you. Because basically, you know, something's wrong. People are stuck. Uh, and or or people are being, um, cons you know, kind of shoved and coerced into something that they feel is a disaster and they're trying to figure out how to get out of it. The, the decision tree looks like this. Number one, is it a relationship problem? Number two, is it a leverage problem? Relationships are the personal part. Leverage is the situational part. And the relationship problems could be they're avoiders and you can't get them to say anything about how they actually feel. And so my tendency is to debrief a lot of what's been happening, what's going on in this conversation, how's the conversation happening? You know, oh, they're not showing up to any of the meetings where the real difficult stuff is gonna be discussed or, or they just won't respond when we ask them a tough question. So then I'll hypothesize might be personality, but the personality in the relationship problem might be uh, they were betrayed a year ago in some contract and they're not over it, uh, but you forgot about that. From their point of view, it's important. From yours, it just faded. Uh, you know, all those different dimensions that are interpersonal have to do with emotions and relationships. So that's one track. And then the other is a leverage track, which is, um, you know, th the other party, usually the one then consulting me, thinks they have a complete advantage in the negotiation and are being bullies. And so my uh, move there is let's investigate this situation and find the weaknesses and vulnerabilities that they actually have. And let's analyze them a little more vividly. And then let's look at your position and see what possible losses the other side might face, small or large, if you were to walk away. And the losses could be multidimensional. I mean, I, you know, it's simple. Uh, Walmart is uh, negotiating with a tiny little products company, and they, but they have a really kind of unique little uh, like product for skincare or something. And, and Walmart says, well, you know, here's our price, end of story. And so uh, the guy comes to me and says, well, what do we do? It's Walmart, you know, and we need the contract. And I go, absolutely, you don't want to break the contract. But let's think about how hard it would be to be replace you. Uh, and so then you kind of go to what's the unique proposition? What would the switching costs be? What would the inconvenience be? What would the customers who don't come to rely on this product think of Walmart if they dropped it? So there are all these little nuanced things that just add a little dimension of leverage to the weak guy side and then uh, send them back into the room with a conversation about how everybody can win by making some small modification that's more than zero, but not anything close to what they want. So it's, a, uh, it's those two factors that I would point to first. And I guess in a mediation, when one side is bullying the other and, and, and overbearing, it could be personality. In that case, you've got that kind of problem. It could be you've triggered a belief and they think it's threatened. That could be a problem. Uh, or it could be that they think they have all the leverage and they're, uh, they need to be educated a little on what the alternatives really look like and uh, get, if you don't have the influence to make, get delivered that message, look to see who is credible to them and who they trust to deliver the message. Uh, and so those would be some things that I would think about. And in those leverage situations, what role does reciprocity play? In leverage is suggesting right. you, you might do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, you're going to get yeah, back. Yeah, reciprocity plays a role in all negotiations. That's a fundamental point, give and take. Uh, so you know, you you give a little, uh, you are entitled to ask for a little. Uh, that's the way I view it. 
Uh, there was a wonderful, I guess we got time for this, but I'll just tell a quick story that, that a woman who told me this, who was in a very tight negotiation, it was in a bankruptcy situation, they were at an impasse and she had at her wits end. So finally, during the break, she went and bought a bag of M&Ms and she brought it back to the table and she opened it and poured it out on the table. And she put half the M&Ms on the other guy's side and she kept half. And then she put one M&M in the middle of the table and said, we got to get going here. I'm going to make you a concession. It's worth one M&M. And she made the concession. And then she looked at the person and says, now it's your turn. And so the guy kind of went, you know, well, it was sort of playful, broke the mood. So he took an M&M, he put it in the middle of the table and said, okay, that's my one M&M concession. And she said, that's not worth one M&M. And he said, yes, it is. And she said, well, okay. And then she put two M&Ms in and she made it a little bigger. And then he cut into. So you see what happened was the M&M process broke the impasse by making it just so small, just worth one M&M. But it got reciprocity going again. So, uh, so that's what you need. It's like a pump. You've got to prime it. And well, that's a sweet note on which to end the conversation because it's nine o'clock, and we promised our audiences that we begin on time, and we end on time. Professor Richard Shell from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. What a fantastic hour! Thank you so much. Thanks so much to Natalie Armstrong Motan for founding the Will Work for Food Project last year. Jean, my wonderful co-host on these webinars. Thanks so much. We had over 85 people here at the peak. Please contribute to fillabundance.org if you can. Please let Natalie and us know the uh, contributions. We'll be delighted to add them to our running total. Professor Richard Schell, this was just fantastic. Thank you once again. And with that, my friends, we are complete. Thank you, Jeff. See you guys. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.